I'm your moderator, Jamil Smith. I'm a senior writer with Rolling Stone magazine. And without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Jen Tolentino to my immediate left. She's the director of policy and civic tech with Rock the Vote. We have Rafael Casal, who you may have seen in his film debut, Blind Spotting. Go see it. And Holly Gordon, the chief impact officer at Participant Media. So let's get started, folks. How's everybody doing? Um, Magical. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just open this to the group, but I'll start with you, Jen. To you, what is the relationship between art and politics? Um, so that's a very, like a very broad question, and I regret sitting directly next to you now, <laughs> as I'm sure I could learn from your answers before mine. Um, to me, um, the relationship between art and politics, it's um, both a reflection and something that can be used to influence. Um, and I think mm. it's interesting to think of art as a tool to influence politics and sort of how does our culture reflect itself back in art. But then also, I think what we've seen, especially since the 2016 election, um, is how art can be leveraged in a way to kind of uplift people, bring different messaging, and break through some of the rhetoric that we're, that we're seeing. Um, so I think it, it is not just one thing, but it's a, a tool that can be used in a lot of different ways. Do either of you have any thoughts on that question? I was going to write notes because I thought Raphael was going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Rafael, um, why don't you go first real quick? <laughs> so, sure. Um, uh, building on what Jen just said, um, I firmly believe that artists uh, can see around corners. And often, artists are the first. They're like the canaries in the coal mine. They're sometimes the first uh, to see um, a revolution on the horizon. Um, and certainly, at Participant, when we're working on our major features, we're working two, three years in advance. Um, and so often the films break, seem to be breaking through at a zeitgeist moment and we could think we're really awesome at picking movies, but actually it's the directors who made the films who saw that zeitgeist moment before everyone else did. So I firmly believe that artists are soothsayers um, and we should be listening to them very closely. And then the second thing that's amazing about art is that it uh, is a, a mirror. It does make both visible and sometimes deeply personal things that are otherwise invisible or feel like they're happening to other people. So the sort of transformation that can happen when you're in a film and you're climbing inside the lives of characters who don't look like you, who come from a different background from you, who've had a completely different experience, but you're connected to them through humanity. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, their experience becomes your experience and you can leave, leave motivated um, to, to make change. And so, you know, it... Um, it has this it has this transformational effect as opposed to sort of a transactional effect. It can really transform the way you see the world and your perspective on things, um, and so deeply motivating, especially when it comes to um, getting out the vote and being political. Because at the end of the day, those are the actions that help us create the future we want to see. Indeed, indeed, we want to get to that. But I first want to hear from the soothsayer on the panel here, uh, yes, our Mr. artist. Uh, and 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 Raphael, I want to ask you. You know, obviously, you can tell folks what blind spotting is about for those who haven't seen it. And you know, there are some you know very real things about our world that are reflected in the story. Can you tell us a little bit about whether or not that was intentional and how intentional it is for you to use that art as a way to be political? Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> well, good. Um, blind, blind spotting is about the um, about this uh, this idea of our of our inherent biases um, based on our particular vantage points or experiences in life, and that every person is sort of seeing the world through the the lens of their collective experiences, and so you're always sort of missing aspects that are not directly related to the way in which you walk through life, mm -hmm. and the way in wh which that affects two best friends, one played by myself, the other played by my co-writer, Davi Diggs. Um, I think the, the, the function of, I'll, I'll steal some other people's good ideas first. <laughs> Uh, James Baldwin has this great quote where he says, the role of the artist is that of the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. Mm -hmm. 
So I always argue that art is, is made out of love first and that the function of it is to shed light or grant perspective in some way. Another quote who I'm not exactly sure to who to attribute it to because it's, it's been reset many times, but that art either upholds or challenges the status quo, but it always does one or the other. Right. Um, and so I think then the, the function of, of art, if it comes from a place of love, if it is meant to in some way challenge or elaborate on the status quo, is essentially the, the, the melting pot of ideas mm -hmm. um, that to me is very much the beginning of the process, like you said, is the, is the mirror. Um, but a mirror that gives us a reflection that is not necessarily who we are, but questioning who we are. Um, and then the, the, the relationship that it has to politics is just that then politics is, is responsible for executing on what the findings are and the way that we engage with art. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it always feels like a very clear path where it's like, well, if we're going to bring these things up, and that's great, what are we then going to do with the things that we found about ourselves? So Jen, I, let me just ask you then, we were talking a little bit backstage about how, you know, when people go and, and, and experience this art, take in this art, they can come out with a whole bunch of different emotions, some of them productive, some of them not so productive when it comes to our democracy. How do you and your role take that energy and translate it towards a positive outcome? Yeah, um, so I think one of the things we've also found is there is this narrative where if you take art that is um, joyful and communal and channel it in a positive way that makes people feel like there is um, hope, there is something that they can look forward to, and then channeling that toward, um, we at Rock the Vote are very focused on the next generation of voters and building their long-term political power. And so when they are seeing themselves represented, represented as powerful in various forms of media and art, they then can think of themselves as somebody who can make change. And what we do at Rock the Vote is sort of try to think about um, taking that energy, not just in wanting to be volunteering, wanting to sort of give back, not to just like, you know, support causes that they want to do, but how does that relate to actually casting a ballot? Um, we've seen that this generation is incredibly altruistic. Um, they care a lot about their communities, but that has not demonstrated um, sort of channeling that into political power. And so that's where we don't necessarily have to do the work of convincing them that things need to change and that um, they are powerful, we need to convince them and talk to them about how that can relate to actually casting a ballot in November and what does it mean to vote in a midterm. They often, um, young people aren't as, like civic education in our country has really declined. And so an understanding of what midterms are, the fact that you don't just vote every four years, how do you um, actually cast a ballot that you need to be registered to vote um, if you're away at college, do you need to request an absentee ballot or can you vote there? Do you have options? Like all of those different things are really difficult for somebody who just turned 18 and doesn't understand how to navigate the process. So that's what we really focus on is sort of trying to build that gap and then working um, with partners in the media space to craft messaging and art that will convince them of that harder part where it's like, taking that energy they care about and convincing them that voting is an avenue for successful change in their communities. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask you know, all of you on the panel to weigh in on this, um, and I'll start with you, Holly. Just how does that process work between the you know, people who are involved in politics and people who are involved in entertainment? Yeah, so it's funny because um, how many of you have heard of Upworthy? The email that has inspirational story. Yeah, great. So um, I worked I there for two years. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so I was on the phone with Eli Pariser. So Upworthy is a. Um, a uh, they sort of made their name by sending you a piece of great, inspiring news or video or some kind of nugget like the the social good version of the of Daily Candy. I'm really dating myself here. <laughs> um, but your everyday email that's a social good version. And I was talking to Eli because I'm obsessed with community organizing. And the reason I'm obsessed with community organizing is because I've worked in the world of media for many years. I was at ABC News for years, and now I work at Participant, where we make really big um, films. And ABC News was all about, I was into that career because I believed that stories could change the way people see the world. And if they just understood things better, they'd make different decisions. Um, 
And it was in my work on a project called Girl Rising, which was a big film-driven campaign about girls' education. And then I realized we made a really inspiration, almost PSA-like inspiring movie um, that really got people excited to act. But what I realized was that the, the missing piece was getting from the screen into communities. And so I was talking to Eli because Eli, and you know, we have a lot in common, he said, I said, so how'd you end up at Upworthy? And he said, well, I was a community organizer and I would be going door to door and then something would happen in the world and there'd be stories on the news or there'd be a big movie about an issue and suddenly everyone would answer the door and do what I asked them to do. So I knew that I needed to get into media. So here I was, a media person obsessed with community organizing and here I'm talking to a community organizer who became obsessed with media. So it really is the magic is bridging that gap. And I think we're in an incredible moment in the world because technology can help us do that and because we're seeing a, 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 a generation of young people who, as Jen said, um, are born with an understanding they have access to a platform, they have access to markets, and they have their own voice. And so it is the civic education piece, I think, that really is vital um, if we're going to get to where we need to go because we were having a backstage conversation before we got up here about how voter suppression is real. Like, really, there are people who don't want everybody in the United States to vote. Um, and we've become lazy as the world's largest democracy. Um, you know, be, having a democracy is sort of like, oh, yeah, of course we get to vote. Like, oh, yeah, of course democracy works, right? Um, and when you go to countries where democracy is not as rooted, you get 80% voter turnout. And, Jen, you know the, 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 the numbers here. I don't, but they're not that. So I think the magic is... Um, if you are somebody who loves um, social good content and it motivates you, then you need to do the extra work of, com of learning how to community organize around that social content if you want to sort of be a progressive advocate who makes change with art. And if you're a really good at community organizing, here's a top tip. Start looking at what's happening in the art world and bring art into your community organizing. Mm -hmm. And together, you end up with really strong, like a ton of power. So, next thing. Oh, gosh, I am that person. It's I, very gentle, No, I'm not actually that person. Okay, good. I thought it was me. Um, so, on that point, though, you know, how much is this heightened consciousness around, you know, art and social activism? Simply certain communities uh, becoming more aware of what other communities have been living with for a very, very long time. And... I think, you know, certainly in your America to Me series that's on stars right now, um, you see kids dealing with stuff that, you know, frankly, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks have been dealing with for generations now. Um, can you all speak to how the current, you know, artistic reflection of our reality reflects certain things for certain people more brightly? Your turn, Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find the best entry points of the question. Um, well, your movie's a perspective that is in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that there is a there is a way in which there's a way in which the arts can bring things to light, mm -hmm. which is which is beautiful. There are <laughs> there are the politics of art and the art of politics. There there's there's very much a political. Um, element to the way in which art gets created and who gets to create art and who gets right. to live on the main stage in the same way, right? Like, I don't know if the, the, the trifecta of the summer movies about the black experience, <laughs> <laughs> blind spotting, black Klansmen, and sorry to bother you, would have right. happened in 2016 or 2014 or 2010. Yeah. Um, there is, there's been a boiling point of issues, especially about the tension between communities of color, color, specifically black men and police, that have allowed us to get to the point where the film is, is commercial enough where people are willing to make the bet that it's something that people will spend money to see based on how much time it's had to, it's had to live in the, in, the, in the public conversation. Right. I don't always count that as a win. <laughs> true, you know, true. Like, I'm happy that the film got made. I'm not happy that the film had to exist. Mm. You know what I mean? So the, the duality of that artistic experience is, is or troubling that it took at times. this year, for, or these last few years, to have something bubble to the surface that's been there for some time. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think what, what is great, at least from m my vantage point, whether it's in film or in the, in the poetry space where I've worked a lot or in the, in the, the, the theater space, is it's, it's, 
we were talking earlier um, yeah. before we walked in here about um, this this show that I was on a while back called Deaf Poetry on HBO and how it very much the poetry community was one of the few places where we were holding like, town halls essentially and people right. of the community could speak. The theater, the 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 cinema, the the poetry venue are places where town halls are coming together that are not specifically about politics, but you can engage people in the same way if it's done right. right. And so I, I I'm usually. I'm excited when enough has stirred in communities where people are willing to, or, or feel as though that we've, we've hit a boiling point, whether it's we talked about it on Twitter long enough and aren't getting anywhere, <laughs> or, or we've had enough debates with, with like-minded people around the dinner table or in our friend circles where we're ready for the slightly larger version of that conversation, whether that ends up being a film or that ends up being a debate we want to watch. And so I think the, 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 the boiling point is mostly what I'm excited about. I think we're where we're a little bit at a crossroads now is we figured out how to get to some of those places. We're not entirely sure how to then engage people into collective action, mostly because there is that sort of disconnect between, or well, I'm mad, and, or, I'm, or I'm sad, mm -hmm. and I'm, in, I'm informed on the issue. How do I then get informed on, on sort of tangible deliverables on the issue, which is where it gets a little murky for people. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just jumping off of the like, people feeling frustrated, um, that's another really big part of getting people convinced that they should be voting is oftentimes a lot of the communities that are experiencing voter suppression are very truly not feeling represented. And so why do they think that they should participate in a system that is not reflective of them, that is actively kind of counter to what they actually want to get done? And so that conversation is often really difficult to have with we're asking people to try to engage with something that they don't necessarily believe in in a meaningful way with a lot of good right to do that. And so it's it you can't approach every single community and every single um, different identity in the same way with the same message. And so that's another part of the work we're doing is how do we create authentic messengers and really effective media to reach all of the different audiences with different things that are gonna motivate them because you can't assume that everybody is going to receive the message in the same way because they have very different experiences with voting and what that means for them. Right, and, and also, you know, getting to that point, there's an authenticity issue. You know, you have to make sure that you are not just putting something out that reflects reality, but also, I guess in a way, markets the authenticity of the thing that you're depicting or the, the message that you're trying to convey. I think all of you in your various fields can, can speak to that. Um, I'll start with you, Hal. Yeah, well, I was interested when you were saying it's, you know, about America to me, um, uh, which is a 10-part series that Participant um, has made that's uh, with Steve James, um, an Academy Award-winning director, documentarian, um, that follows uh, 12 kids through a year of high school in Oak Park, Illinois, and it's an incredibly progressive high school where they feel as though they're doing everything right in terms of integration and opportunity, and yet the achievement gap between African-American students at this school and the other students um, is, it, it's not changing. And for to get to equity t would take 70 years. And so this series walks into the school um, and, and unpacks what's happening through the eyes of kids. And to your point, Jamil, um, no African American I've spoken to who's seen the series, this is not a newsflash. And so for me, um, what's interesting about the series is twofold. Um, number one, a white man made it. We have another series, we have another film, a beautiful film um, called Roma by Alfonso Cuaron. And it really explores, it's an it's a autobiographical film about his time in Mexico, um, growing up in Mexico at a time of revolution and unrest. And there's, a, um, there's an overlay of the disintegration of his own family. And the story is told through the eyes of his nanny, um, a woman who it took him till his 40s to making this, 50s making this film, to understand how to completely three-dimensional life that as a child he was not aware of. Um, so the film is told through the eyes of this woman, um, completely disenfranchised woman, and his mother is the other main character. So here we have a white man who's telling an African-American 
um, a story of, of, of discrimination and structural, dis structural discrimination. Um, and we have a, um, a Mexican man telling a very, very feminist story. And I am grateful for both of them, but it's not where we need to land ultimately. Um, and so um, I feel as though this idea, both of them are incredibly authentic because they both started with a, 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 a authentic question that was true to the artist. Steve's kids had gone through Oak Park and his question was, what's going on here? I wanted to, he's, he, will, he would say, I wanted to unpack what was going on in the school. And so, and he's always, he made hoop dreams. He's always be, been interested in the black American experience. Um, and because it comes from an authentic place, you feel the love in the care that he took with making it. And with Roma, Alfonso wanted to explore his childhood. And it turns out that his childhood revolved around women. And through this beautiful film, he's, he's shed light on the, on, the, on, on the lives of domestic workers who are usually invisible. And this film makes visible and three-dimensional. And so I'll stop there because I'm going on and on. But it's... Um, <laughs> You know, that authenticity, um, I think we can be quick to judge um, uh, when some, you know, someone who feels like they shouldn't be, t the idea of co-opting a story, but I think we also mm -hmm. need to, um, to, to, to be more willing to accept, to be willing to accept stories from many places, but, and also to look for them in many places. Right, and, and the flip side, Jenna, I want to ask you, you know, folks in Washington who are, you know, see, you know basically shaping this political reality, um, are they consuming art and or seeing the art that's reflecting reality in, in sort of the same that we that we, that we do? Or are they understanding how what they do is shaping what they see, maybe on the screens or you know even in documentary films like that? Um, so I'm not sure. I at my role at Rock the Vote, I used to work in Washington. In at Rock the Vote, I'm now it, based in Los Angeles and more focused on the sort of policy at the state level and organizing young people and building like sort of how do we kind of engage them. Um, I can only look at sort of the narrative that I'm seeing around like the individual people that are running for office mm. and sort of the issues that they're pushing forward and the agendas that, that we're sort of seeing coming out of this election. So rather than looking at it from the like people currently elected and how they're processing the art that's coming, um, I think what we're seeing is sort of this influx of new candidates, young people, lots of women running for office, where I think because there's this influx of art that is telling them that they can, that is telling mm. their stories, that is giving them a place at the table, they are taking it, um, which I think is really exciting. And that's sort of what um, we're kind of trying to leverage is this new type of candidate, this new type of um, elected official and what that can actually mean for engaging the generation that we're trying to like change the, the country. Gotcha, gotcha. So Rafael, I wanted to ask you, you know, are, to what degree you feel, that you feel like we're really creating a culturally aware and present society and to what degree, like we were talking about earlier, are people maybe exploiting you know, the sort of the current trends of what's going on in the news. Um, I mean, that's, that's a, this also goes back to, to, to a certain degree of, of co-opting stories and who's co-opting stories and who's sort of authentically allowed to present them, right? Right. And I, I think for the most part there, Every project is sort of up for the assessment of that debate <laughs> when it when it comes out, and we do it every time. You know, every time some, something new gets announced online, you get sort of immediate feedback of whether or not this feels on the level with with where we are mm -hmm. um, as a country. And I like that that's a constantly moving conversation. That there isn't sort of like some specific set of rules, but that it's growing with the with the way in which the industry is changing and the perception of people is changing in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And so a, a film that was made or a play that was made in the 80s is just not acceptable now or couldn't get made now. Right. I was like, I, there was, was a film I was watching the other day, I think it was Mrs. Doubtfire, I watched it again, I was like, this is pretty transphobic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, right. Driving Miss Daisy won this picture in 89. Breakfast Club, you know? yeah, I was they, like, they would never make this. They would never make this now. And even a lot of times when we're going out and looking for new projects, it's like, we'll go look at some of our old you know, intellectual properties and 
see if you want to remake them. And it's like, well, are you ready to change how <laughs> sexist this was? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and then, of course, always asking the question of the creator ourselves. Like, are we the right people mm. to take this on? Or are we the right people to find the right person to take this on because you're giving us the opportunity? And yeah. at, what point, at, at what point are you playing the appropriate role that you're supposed to be playing in the process? And are you, are, do, you, do you have a vantage point that is in some way um, sincere enough and relevant enough where people want to hear it from you. Just the fact that you want to say it is not in itself enough, but then it will right. be received well by the people that you hope that it's re you know, received by. So I think a lot of the films that came out this year has been a lot of you know, sort of fiercely political films, whether they were overtly political or, or just the mere creation of them was a political act. And the, it, it mattered who made them, mm -hmm. you know, and, who, and, and where they came from, where they, you know, massively funded studio productions, or did they come from artists making their first few films? Are they filmmakers who are directly related to the subject matter, or are they super removed? Mm -hmm. And the, the beauty is that generally the court of public opinion will decide. I mean, that's the great thing about art, is it has to get voted up organically. Right, um, right. Well, in that respect, I mean, in terms of blind spotting, I mean, how have people who are, say, involved in the movement, you know, or even just regular citizens who are just politically aware, how have they reacted to what you were able to depict in the film and also, you know, maybe some of the other art that's been going on that you mentioned this year? I think so far it's been, it's been largely really positive. Um, it's, it's been, the, obviously the film had a, had, a, had a great theatrical release and was really, really well received there. And, um, and it's been a great teaching. Like the, the thing we get the most is that the film is rated R, mm -hmm. is how many requests we get to, to show it in, in like high schools. Huh. And that, that that's a tricky thing to navigate because of the rating of the film. But that, it, that people want to use it as a tool because I think the, to a certain degree, it's very hard in, in two and a half minutes for a trailer to market something that is gonna feel complicated enough to not oversimplify an issue. But the whole goal of the film was to make sure that the only real villain in the film are systemic problems and not personal problems or not vilifying any particular party right. um, or, or person. And that's a very fun place for us to sit in the conversation is to express as many different sort of vantage points as possible. And have people watch it and go, oh, where do I most readily sit in, in relation to these characters in this story? And that's everything from a police officer that's, that's, that's involved in the shooting to the person who was victimized, to the, to the spectators, to the family and friends of the people who, who, who witnessed this thing or, or were in the city when it was going on. Um, so I think that, that, has, that has been great. I think what, what does happen, unfortunately, sometimes with political art is, depending on how it's messaged, some people are, are quick to assume what it's about and don't see it. And so sometimes mm. we get a lot of stuff that's just for the choir and not stuff that's so much for the masses. And I think that's the threshold that's really hard for filmmakers is when it is a film that is somewhat overtly political, like a Michael Moore film, <laughs> you, you're, you, you know yeah. who it's for and <laughs> right. it's like rigidly for. Right. And it's probably not gonna make it across the aisle, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Jenna, to that point, I mean, how do you use art and social, you know, in the midst of, you know, art and really the social activism of the people who respond to works like that to motivate people to get out and vote? Yeah, I mean, I what you were describing and the the vetting process for um, like filmmakers and art distribution was sort of what I was trying to get at with the candidates. So like trying to make sure they're representative of their communities, that they are responsive, that it, it is a constantly moving threshold, I think is so important and that's what I'm really excited to be seeing. Um, the way Rock the Vote tries to leverage art and media, um, I think maybe if you're familiar with Rock the Vote at all, you might have known that we used to work with MTV. We still do, um, but in, in the 1990s, they were our majority, like that was where young people were. They were watching music videos on MTV. We told them to rock the vote. Um, now, it's different. Um, young people consume media and political news and information in general in a variety of different ways, and so we have to kind of target it, and we can target it really differently. Um, what we're doing now is we're running some really targeted digital voter registration ads and testing out what kind of video can be um, actually meaningful to get somebody who is not currently registered to register to vote. And what we're seeing is like you have to try to localize it. So putting something where if we're focused on Philadelphia, like 
a corner store in Philadelphia so that you have people seeing themselves in the videos taking those mm -hmm. actions. You see people in their communities actually like building power and like attending and voting. So it's not just a direct to camera like PSA of um, celebrities that they know telling them that it's important. It's they're just kind of lightly seeing themselves like, oh, that's something that means something to me. And then you talk about the issues of um, you should really vote for your district attorney because I'm sure you care about criminal justice reform and this is what that means to you. Right. Are you registered to vote? Do it now. So trying to play with all of the different things we have available and um, we've also partnered with a number of different films that are getting released and like different ways that we can galvanize young people that are attending these filmings, seeing the content, feeling like they wanna take action and then directly turning that into like getting registered then we send them everything they need to actually turn out and making sure that they're informed and excited. And especially when you um, look at midterm turnout, um, if you guys are all from California, midterm turnout for young people in 2014 was 7.8%. Um, so we have, a, we have a pretty low threshold for what it was four years ago. And my hope is that this year it's gonna be pretty different. Um, it's, it can only get better, I'm assuming. So I think midterm and the midterm dropout is very real because people don't think that their vote matters and they don't understand why you would vote not just in presidential. And so that's what we're actively trying to create content to explain the importance of voting and explain the importance of midterms. Holly, what, what, in terms of participants' mission, I mean, I feel like this is, this is right up your alley a little bit in terms of like engaging people to do things, not just simply to just take things in. Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know Participants Work, Participant was a, is a, um, a film company founded by Jeff Skoll, uh, who was the co-founder of eBay, and his vision, which was prescient 12 years ago, um, actually almost 14, 15 years ago, um, was uh, stories uh, can inspire social change, social action, that a good story well told um, can change the way people see the world and ultimately change their behaviors. Um, and participant um, powered onto the scene with an inconvenient truth. Um, and uh, the company has made uh, almost 100 films now, many of which you've heard of, Spotlight, um, Waiting for Superman, Food, Inc., more recently, Wonder, The Post. Um, and these are all films that may not be overtly um, social... Um, uh, they're, they're, they don't all, for example, wonder, doesn't have an overt, clear message that is a get out the vote kind of message, <laughs> but the message of kindness that's baked in, reaching you know, 350 million in box office, I'm good with that. Um, and then some, like the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary, RBG, that we just produced this year, has a much more overt message and actually speaks to this idea of visible role models, right? So if right. you can see, so I'm hearing lots of themes of social change, right? So if you can see um, a visible role model, uh, visible role models are a pathway to change. So being able to see yourself, your own experience on the screen um, is enormously empowering. I have a friend um, who teaches uh, second graders in Georgia um, and she's been teaching for 25 years and we were on a walk and um, she said, you know, Holly, before President uh, Obama was elected, every year I've done the same thing. I've asked our, my second graders, what do they uh, want to be when they grow up? Pr predominantly African-American students, classrooms that she has. Not a single one of them wrote president. And this was when he was still president. We were still celebrating. And um, she says, since he's become president, it's like a third or half the class. So I got a lot of presidents in, in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> but that's just such a writ large impact of what a visible role model can do, right? Um, so this idea that the, I'm gonna build on something that's a little different, which is that I find it sort of ironic and both a hugely exciting challenge and sometimes a humbling one, which is that content is a tool that can be used at scale, i.e. everyone can see a film and you suddenly can create a national or international narrative around something, um, while at the same time, people want more and more particular messaging. So at the same time that we are able to unleash the power of content across borders and time zones and organize people around a set, a shared set of values or a vision of the future, we are also challenged with how you make it specific enough 
um, and targeted enough that you actually make that, um, you know, that final tip. And so um, we have, you know, when you have the Russians potentially meddling in our relation, our elections using content and ISIS, they, ISIS uses content to recruit. Um, I feel as though we are in the sort of renaissance of content. I feel like we're in the battle for the future of the world we want to see, and content is the most powerful tool we have. And so it's hugely exciting, and as I said, enormously humbling at the same time. Right. Well, at this point, I think we come to the elephant in the room in that, in that discussion, which is, of course, we are now in a different era with a different president. And how has that changed your perspectives on how well, art is political? This guy, our current president, is a genius at using messaging, a genius. So if you want to know how to um, create messages that, you know, the dog whistle stuff that he does, you know, find your base and how do you activate, um, uh, I, I mean, it's all the kind that doesn't paint a future of the world, it's personally, that I want to see where you, you bully people publicly, um, you, you mock people, you're negative about collaboration, et cetera. But, but, but give him his due, he sure knows how to use that Twitter feed to get what he wants. And, 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 and Raphael and Jen, I want to ask you about, you know, how does that, I, I see a lot of people getting cynical. You know, I mean, I was, a lot of cynical people all the time. But, I mean, especially now, they really maybe feel like they, like, None of this is making any difference, you know, and we're in an era where things are maybe regressing and then we see, you know, people actually being engaged in elections. We see people engaged in art. How, what are we supposed to take from all that? Yeah, um, like from our perspective, what we have found in um, kind of reaching out, doing message testing, what really actually mobilizes um, young people is joyful, hopeful, communal, Hope. upful, like mm -hmm. messaging that does not, it breaks through. We're not talking about how terrible things are right now. We're gonna talk about how important voting is, how we're all gonna do this together, how we're gonna build a future together because politics has become something so distasteful for so many people that you just wanna shut it off and you don't wanna talk about it. But it, so if you lead with something negative, they aren't, you don't wanna participate, you want nothing to do with that. But if you lead with something that is uplifting and you feel like you can actually make a difference and you're not just one voice shouting into the void with absolutely nobody listening, but you are all saying it together and if you show up, you can make it make change. Um, we found that to be incredibly powerful. Indeed, indeed. Raphael, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, here I go. <laughs> <laughs> I think fear is infectious, but not desired. Mm. Yeah. So it's very easy to lead with fear, but it's not a sustainable emotion to provoke with. Mm -hmm. um, I think at every great turning point of growth in the world, it has been a massively polarizing moment right before. So I find that very inspiring. Yep. I think the, the you, you can be my hype man on this if you yeah. want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, other th the other thing that happened, which I love, is that um, this, is, this is me trying to be the pessimistic optimist, is um, before this motherfucker, <laughs> um, the idea of a, of a presidential candidate was like, you need to be perfect. Right. He's such a disaster that like any, any person with a, with a complicated history or with an interesting take on the way to engage in politics, like the door is open in a way that it wasn't before. Like, my peers are thinking about going into politics in a way that they never were before. Mm -hmm. And that's been really beautiful as a new kind of uh, political engagement as far as the leaders that we're looking at. Right. Because the, the playing field of, 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 of radical politics are in a very, very different place. The other thing I'll say is, um, and I was doing this, uh, I worked in marketing for a while, first at Upworthy and a few other places, and the, the workshop that I was doing right around the time that he got elected was mm -hmm. 
to talk about the way in which he utilized narrative structure just better than Hillary did. And that so much mm. of that was the reason that it, that it took hold. Now, it wasn't a good story, but it was structurally a sound story. Okay. And that's, that's where my optimism lies, is that it wasn't a good movie. It was just like a formula movie. And those land mm. better than a movie that structure is kind of all over the place or like hard to grasp the themes of. Right. But I'm very optimistic that there's a better story, <laughs> um, that there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a leader or a politician or a community organizer who, one, has the authentic entry point that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. that has a better sense of narrative structure or the same level of narrative structure of how to tell a story that isn't a fear-mongering one or isn't one that's like preying on our worst selves but our best selves. Right. And that is, a, that is a just ultimately, at the end of the day, a, a, a more enticing, attractive, interesting story for us to all rally around. And I don't need that person to then deliver the world. I just need them to fucking try. Right. Indeed. Um, no, you can clap if you want. I heard somebody no. clap. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, in that light, though, I mean, <laughs> here I am. I'm sorry. I'm a journalist, man. It's like, you know, it's all going to hell. Um, I, um, I, you know, I see, you know, a lot of folks um, using social media, including the president, to convey that message. Um, how do you all feel like it works for you either as artists or people who are, you know, involved in, you know, this machine of democracy. Social media? Yes. In light of what we were just talking about, because there's some, you know, messaging and what have you. Yeah, I mean, it's great because it allows us to reach a lot of different um, communities in a lot of different ways. Um, the Rock the Vote social media handles aren't the only ways that we kind of reach them. We actively are kind of constantly looking and pursuing different messengers and so feeding them like this is a really important day. Um, for example, Tuesday, uh, all of the panels here have heard me talk about this already. Um, I work in civic engagement and so National Voter Registration Day is a very big deal for me. Um, I'm sure you guys are all aware it's Tuesday. Um, and so we're engaged in how do we build um, momentum around this holiday where in advance of all of the um, state voter registration deadlines, where if you aren't registered by that deadline, if you've moved, if you've changed your name, if you have never registered to vote before, you won't be able to vote in the upcoming election depending on your state. So everybody sort of across the country, we try to engage influencers outside of our own network because if you're already following Rock the Vote, you probably are already registered. We've harassed you enough about it. You're aware. Mm. Um, but we'll try to find another, like who else might be um, kind of not aware that they need to be registered and they need to be asked still. And so that's kind of how we leverage social media is we put out our message, we kind of constantly like are talking about like any new voting rights issues that are happening, trying to keep people apprised of the deadlines that they need to know about, but actively seeking out different authentic messengers to carry the water for us, mm -hmm. which can be really helpful in kind of crafting those messaging and spreading it much further than our own ability. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm just thinking that I need to talk to our digital media manager and make sure that participant media is rocking the vote on Tuesday. So we need to talk about that afterwards. So we're, and all of you can be those authentic messengers as well. That's the beauty to me of mm -hmm. social media is that our world is interconnected and we are now, I see a future where we're less defined by the color of our skin, the language we speak, the country we live in, and as borders are more porous and identities are more uh, mixed, that we're, that we're united by the values we believe in and the future we wanna see. And so that's what's really awesome about social media is that it can knit together communities who share our values and vision. And so that's, to me, what makes it this incredibly powerful tool. And obviously, every tool that's powerful can also be destructive. Right, right. But and you know, it, it's it, any piece of art can be you know used in for negative or for right. positive too. I mean, it's it's just about you know not just intention, but also you know understanding the zeitgeist of what, what people are waiting for. Like you were mentioning, like this, if you know the movie comes out in 2014, we're having a different conversation. You know. I did yeah. want to build on something that Raphael said about um, hopefulness around this election. 
um, which is a narrative that I tell myself probably once a day, which is that I sort of feel as though this presidency is like a forest fire. Um, in terms of forest fires are so damaging and they're so devastating, but without them, there's no new growth. Mm -hmm. And whether it's that he's got, whether it's that there are thousands of positions that have, b have been left unfilled or bureaucracies being dismantled um, or the two-party systems really being challenged, um, I'm hopeful that with this new birth of the, the number of new candidates that are running for office and they look different than ever before, that's new growth. Mm -hmm. That's new, those are sprouts that if, 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 you know, honestly, if Hillary Clinton had won, maybe we wouldn't be seeing those sprouts. Um, so the, there's been a forest fire and my hope is that there will be new growth. But there's only growth in November 6th if people vote, though, right? That's right. <laughs> but even that, even the forest fire has made people who are completely outside of normally outside of politics mm -hmm. paying attention. I mean, how many of you pay attention more now than you used to? Ra raise, you know, show raise your wow, hand. That's, that's yeah, right? So it's, it's yeah. like, that's good. That's good. That's good. But then, <laughs> you know, there's, there's converting that into action. And so, you know, I just want to, you know, we're running a little bit uh, short on time, but I just want to ask you all a little bit more of an optimistic question in that light, which is, you know, how can art and social activism find new ways to attract younger generation, not just to vote, not just to run for office, but to participate in art, in politics, everything that stimulates us in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I think outside of when we're trying to organize people to get registered and get voting, um, there's all these issues that I'm sure a number of you are aware of that require you to hold your elected officials accountable, uh, making sure that if you have a point of view that you are calling them, and not just at the federal and the state level, but also like really understanding what it means to have a state legislature and what they're doing. I think that piece, um, I'm really interested in kind of digging into how people can have a better understanding of how their government works and who represents them and what they're doing and if they're doing it in their best interest. I think um, trying to organize better civic education, mm -hmm. creating art. Um, I love that your movie, people want to show it in high schools um, mm -hmm. because there isn't good curriculum or material. It's not taught in high schools anymore. Um, we just launched something called Democracy Class with um, the Southern Poverty Law Center that is a sort of three-day curriculum on voting rights, the history of voting, so that people that are you know just turning 18 understand that this right that they're getting when they turn 18 has not always been available to every single American. And it was originally just kind of only white dudes that own property. And the fact that it's slowly kind of evolved in who that, what it looks like, um, using media to explain the importance and break down all of the different barriers where it's difficult to understand, um, I think in general can be really impactful. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Getting young people involved? Um, I just started rewatching The West Wing. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was gonna really make me depressed. And, uh, and it did for the first couple of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but what I realized was so fantastic about that show is one, I, I learned a little bit about government, as little as it was. Mm -hmm. I also was constantly uh, listening to brilliant characters, which I don't see as much anymore on, on television and in film. We, me and my writing partner, David, say all the time now that like writing smart characters is an inherently political act. Mm -hmm. We've gotten into certain periods where um, the lovable idiot or the likable um, villain are, are our most prominent characters. Right. And then we have to be a little bit weary about like how we present ourselves back to ourselves and what level of dignity and intelligence we afford them, even in their moments of like biggest flaws. Like, are we presenting intelligent, competent people? And also, you know, in watching that show, I'm also aware of like what year that show was made and how like painful the like white and male that show is, <laughs> both in the staff, like in the credits and, yes. and on camera. Yeah. And and so I think there's there's this sort of there's this twofold thing that I'm really excited about, which is one, 
making sure that we're, that we're maintaining the intelligence that we want to see back in the world in the art that's being created. And then also making sure that it's accurately reflecting the kind of world that both we're experiencing and that we want to see, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, a lot of the projects that we're, that we're looking at now, the source material for them is the cinema of the last 40 years. And watching that, you can see how inaccurate of a representation that is of the country that we live in. So that then all I can then pull from that is going, okay, well then, who is then going to be in these casts and who needs to be on this writing staff and who needs to be on this producing staff and how is just the just to me the political acts of making sure those people are in positions of authority impact the way in which we we build the mirror that reflects uh, us back to ourselves Indeed. so i think there's there there's that and 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 raising the bar on intelligence so that when something comes up whether it's like civic engagement and, and 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 interest in politics it doesn't feel like a stretch for you as a person or mm -hmm. that it's abnormal based on the way in which you see yourself in the world but it very much is status quo and right. i feel at the moment civic engagement is not as status quo as it should be gotcha gotcha holly do you have any last thoughts on that no but i really like that last idea which is um that we want the next generation and when, he, when i was 20 and all the older people at work used to talk, say like, it's all on you. I'd be like, wait, you're supposed to be figuring it out. And now I'm, it's another old lady move. I was telling these guys that I do all these old lady things now. And I'm like, oh God, what's wrong with me? I'm turning to my mother. Anyway, so that, that this idea is that the next generation, that civic engagement is part of your identity. It's part of who you are, being curious, knowing who's running for, running for state attorney general or um, comptroller even, that is like <laughs> something that's cool. And if you don't know, you're not cool. So that's like my dream for the future, is that we have a far more engaged uh, youth um, and that that's the result of the crazy um, connectivity that we are experiencing today and the, and the sort of double edge of the most connected world we've ever had and the thirst for local engagement. Hmm. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd love to keep talking to you all, but I just want to thank you all for doing your part in your own way to create that better future. Thank you very much to Jen Tolentino, to Rafael Casal, and to Holly Gordon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you guys for hanging out. Coming. Appreciate it.